and welcome to the Hay Book Club for June. I'm Helen Chersky and today we are going to be discussing this book here which is Shape which the, it's the Hay Festival Book of the Month for June uh, and of course that means that copies are available on the Hay Festival website and at your local bookstore. We all need to be supporting local bookse booksellers and the festival as you just heard. So we, the way this is going to work is I will have a chat uh, with Jordan and then we will have 15 minutes at the end for questions from you. Uh, so you've got a chance to put your questions directly to Jordan and you can submit those questions at any time. There is a questions tab in the uh, screen that you're looking at. And so stick your questions in there at any point and we will get through as many, as, them, as many of them as we can before our time runs out. And an extra thank you to anyone who has donated to the festival's future fund uh, when registering to this event and as you heard you can continue to support the festival by donating on the website so let's get going let's get to our guest today Jordan Ellenberg is a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin and he is the Sunday Times best-selling author of the book How Not to Be Wrong as well as an, a novel The Grasshopper King and his own research is in number theorem we might get to a little bit of what that means later on so Jordan hello how are you? I am great it's great to be here and hello to everyone at the festival. So we have this is this is it's a big book. It's quite a chunky book. <laughs> it's all about geometry. So let's just get started with what sounds like a basic question, but perhaps isn't. And, and that's what is geometry? So geometry, let me probably what most people think when they hear the word is this is going to be about triangles. And there are some triangles in the book. I didn't want to disappoint people. They're sort of right at the beginning. But geometry nowadays means so much more than that. You know, the original word geometry means measuring the earth. That's what it comes from in, in Greek. And that's much more true to the spirit of contemporary geometry, where any time we use notions of what's near, what's far, anytime we use a metaphor like the two sides of an argument or something like that, we are... Um, we are using, we are doing geometric thinking. We're applying geometric reasoning to some problem, which is probably not about triangles. It's probably about sort of something of much greater social importance. Well, we, we're going to get to some of these things. Some of them are a very, very long way, as you say, from what people might think of a geometry. But let's have a look. There's a graphic that uh, is in the front of the book, and we can see it on the screen now. And it contain it shows the links between lots of things. So just run us very quickly through what we're looking at here. Yeah, this was sort of meant to be, you know, if you if you read like Lord of the Rings as a kid, you know, all books of that kind, kind of at the very beginning, you open it up and there's like a big map of the territory that says like where each kind of kind of uh, elf and orc and creature lives. And I, I sort of wanted it to be a bit like that. So um, all the different things that came up in the book, uh, I tried to mark them and then also sort of show how interconnected they were. That was sort of what was, bubbling around in my mind and I, as I tried to write this, you know, as you said, uh, it's a bit of a chunker, right? I, def I set out to write a short book, I always do, uh, but you find you tell these stories and you dig into them and then there's trails that you just can't not go down because you're like, what, really, that happened? I got to go follow that. Uh, and then before you know it, you've written another long book, you know, but I, I think that, uh, I, I, I think that you, you'll, one finds that those stories are sort of very hard to stop telling midstream because they turn out to be great stories. Well, while we've still got the graphic on the screen, um, just to the audience, we won't, in our discussion, cover all of these things. But if you spot something on there you really want to know about that we don't get to cover, you can always stick a question about it in the questions tab and we will get to it later. Uh, so you've got a couple more seconds to look at it, but then we're going we're gonna to take it away from you. It's like some kind of test already. Put it up again it? at the end, I think. <laughs> we'll, we'll show are. it again. You don't well, have to okay. memorize it. There's no quiz. <laughs> but I think the thing that comes in that graphic is there are a lot of words on there that are nothing, you, you know, they are, they, they, it does look like just random words, to be honest, if you, until, you know, you're going to explain the connections to us, but it does just look like random words. But um, just as the first thing I wanted to comment on is that there are a lot of diagrams in here. There's also quite a lot of poetry and you make a big effort to show the connections between geometry, the, the mathematics that you're talking about, and it is mathematics, and the people who you might not expect to be interested in mathematics. So people like Wordsworth, for example, and lots of mathematicians who wrote poems. So just tell us a little bit about why poems come up quite so often. 
I, you know, I still don't know. And it certainly was not something I expected uh, when I wrote the book. But, you know, very early on, yes, I came across this sort of incredible uh, bromance, I guess you would call it, between uh, William Roman William Rowan Hamilton, who was the sort of great young uh, Irish astronomer and mathematician, Wunderkind, who was in his 20s, uh, and the older Wordsworth, who by then was, you know, very well established as a poet. Um, and these two just could not get enough of each other. Wordsworth was an indifferent student mathematically, but he always sort of super, super honored geometry. He saw in it some kind of ineffable truth that I think he saw as akin to what he was trying to capture uh, in poetry. He would get in a big fight with Keats about it. Keats was exactly the opposite and was like, what is all this? Newton ruined everything, like blah, 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 blah. Uh, Wordsworth, you know, he has this sort of famous, I won't be able to quote it right because I don't have it in front of me, but he writes about like, you know, a mind forever voyaging. Like that's, some say that's his portrait uh, of Newton. And so these two, and, but what's funny about this relationship is that Justice Wordsworth, who we know is a poet, uh, esteemed mathematics very highly and was fascinated by this young mathematician. Uh, Hamilton, who is uh, one of the great mathematicians of his day, um, highly esteemed poetry and wanted to be a poet. I mean, they each were getting something from the other. And in fact, um, Hamilton would send all of his poems to Wordsworth and Wordsworth kind of writes in this incredibly gentle letter, uh, which I think comes up very well saying like, your poems are great. Of course, I love them. They're amazing think what would be lost to science. Like, I can't possibly encourage you. Of course, the poems are lousy, but like Wordsworth was such a nice guy that he's like, it, we, the astronomy and mathematics could not take the loss if I encouraged you to go further into poetry. Like you must give it up and devote yourself uh, to your scientific endeavors. I'm sure we can we can all think of a few reviewers of various types in the world who could, could benefit from such diplomacy. <laughs> um, so, now, I think one of the important points about the book, there, there is um, lots of detailed examples, but on the big picture stuff, you make the point at the start, which I think is very important, which is that one of the the fascination of geometry and of course the name that comes up is euclid this this you know for some reason no one ever knows like if you mention geometry euclid and no one is really i think many people haven't read U euclid but that was you know that was how you learn geometry but a lot of it is about logic it's not about triangle it's more about logic than triangles tell me a little bit about that yeah. And by the way, OK, hey, only exclusive. I'm just going to reveal it right here and now. I have not read Euclid. I'm just going to say it. I wrote this entire book and like I've looked at Euclid, but have I read Euclid? Have I studied Euclid? No, in the modern world, that's not really the way we do it. So there I've made a revelation that hopefully will not torch my credibility with like with too many people. But absolutely, you know, there, one thing I found I, I found out while writing is that there was a big survey in the 1950s of American high school teachers saying, hey, why are you doing this? Why are we teaching geometry this kind of like fusty old Greek subject like why are we uh why are we doing it and you know some people said well it's because we want students to know facts about geometry we want them to know like how triangles and circles and line segments work but that was the second most popular answer and the most popular answer by far was we want to train students in this way of thinking this way of deduction this way of systematically building up knowledge from a very small set of axioms which are these kind of uh preordained truths that we take to be absolutely basic and unquestionable. And from this very small foundation, you know, it's kind of like a building starts with a big, thick, chunky foundation, then you build up and it gets narrow. Geometry is the opposite. You try to sort of start from the smallest foundation possible and then build this kind of uh, fantastical structure, like a tree coming out of the ground. And that's also a sort of kind of geometry, the geometry of trees that's all over the book. It's, I mean, one thing I found that, and. I'm just like a wind-up car, by the way. So you can stop me at any time. You sort of start me. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I, another thing I didn't know I was going to write about was Abraham Lincoln, who was a huge geometry. I was just going to ask you about that. So actually, well, I'll ask the question I was going to ask, because I think that one of the things, so going back to, you know, the early history of America, one of the things that is striking was that they, all of them, were very impressed by science in general and ideas about how the solar system worked, for example, and how orbits worked and how there was a central thing in the middle, you know, things orbit around the outside. There were a lot of quite scientific ideas that were rattling around the back of their mind. And so, yeah, so the, the US Constitution, go on then, tell us about the Lincoln and uh, the US Constitution. Yeah, and like everything's sort of all mixed up together, but... Um... 
there's a certainly a really interesting history of, and, and Thomas Jefferson is the name that first comes to mind as an early American, uh, one of the founders who was very deeply invested in science. But actually, I mean, you know, even as an American, there's always a lot for us to learn about our own history. And like, I, I, I really came to see a difference between these two men that I had never grasped before. That for Jefferson, his view of geometry was that it was part of a classical education. He was a gentleman. That was really like who he was. And he talks about reading Newton in the same way he talks about reading Thucydides, right? He was kind of cultured and cultivated. He was an ancient Greek author for anyone who was wondering. But yes. Oh, yeah. Right? Sorry. Yeah. So, Carry on. So, <laughs> you know, Lincoln is the prototypical self-made man. He's much more the image of now the image that Americans want to have about what it means to be an American. And for Lincoln, um, what appealed to him was not, oh, I'm going to be like the most cultured, gentlemanly, patrician person, which is very much not his vibe in any way. What appealed to him about geometry uh, was this very rough hewn, plain spoken, you shouldn't say something unless you can back it up. I mean, he, what, what happens is that he's kind of a lawyer. This is before he's president. He's kind of going around being a lawyer. And he's like, I keep on going into court and being asked to prove something. What does that mean? I don't even know what that word means. And nobody can tell me. And I asked the other lawyers and I asked the judge and they can't tell me either. So I went back to Euclid because I was determined I'm going to learn what it means to actually prove something. And I think for Lincoln, and I discovered for so many other people throughout history, this property of geometry that you can prove stuff and you don't have to rely on some external authority and you don't have to sort of appeal to uh, something official. You can figure it out yourself. That's an immense source of power. It's very democratic in a way. And I think that's what appealed to Lincoln so much about it. Well, you set up, I mean, you mentioned this in the context of the US Constitution that it was written with the structure. There's a line in there, which is almost the structure of a mathematical proof where they say, given these things, then this follows. Yes, we hold these truths to be self-evident. I don't know if that phrase is, it's, it's a very familiar phrase to any American. I don't know if it's familiar in the, in the UK. Um, but yes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, which is very much the way you might describe uh, the axioms of Euclid, that, um, that Euclid will start with these things that use he would say, you simply cannot doubt. If you assert that you doubt them, uh, then we're not talking about the same thing. Now, so by give the way, us, give us an example. Of... Give us an example of something that Euclid thought you couldn't doubt. Because they're very fundamental things. They're, well, I must admit, I'm tempted to say um, the... Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of like which thing to say. I mean... <laughs> Because it's, it's a little hard to separate out the axioms from the definitions, like a point is that which has no extent. That's what, that's a sort of typical Euclidean axiom. That, But um, let me make it with, everybody can see this, right? So I'll make it with my hand. A, the, a very, the, the most famous axiom of Euclid is actually the most controversial one. It's the one that says that if I have a line and if I have some point not on that line, my fist is a point, then there's a line through the point that's parallel to the other line like this. There is one and there's just one. That I think seems very intuitively clear. Um, and yet it's somehow, it always bothered people. It was more complicated than the other axioms and people kept on trying to say, maybe it's not necessary. Maybe- So let's, let's purpose just pick that apart a bit. So if we just, you know, if you imagine holding a piece of spaghetti in the middle and putting your finger above it. Yes. The point is you can get another piece of spaghetti and you can always put a piece of spaghetti through your other point, so it will never touch the first one, however long they both are. Is I just to make I, it a bit more physical? If only I'd had you, I totally would have put this in the book in terms of spaghetti had I thought of doing that. That's a beautiful way to put it. That's right. Um, yes, exactly. And parallel means that, yes, no, no matter how long the strand of spaghetti is, like they'll never meet. And that does seem completely clear. And yet, it's a little convoluted to say, um, and people for years, centuries even, like tried to say, maybe we can derive this from the other axioms that Euclid put down, these seemingly self-evident things. Well, eventually an amazing thing happened, um, which is that not only did people see that they couldn't prove this from the other axioms, they were able to develop completely alternate world geometries in which the first four of Euclid's axioms were true, and this one was not. Just like novel geometry that didn't match up with the geometry that Euclid developed. Um, and as take a step back, perhaps, to the, to the Constitution. The, 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 the structure here is that you agree on some things that everyone agrees on. And you say, OK, assuming we all agree on these things, 
then logic takes us to this step and logic takes us to this step. And every single one of those steps, you can't, if you agree with the first ones, you've got to go there, right? It's, it's true. And the only reason I'm making like hesitation face here is that I think that is a con- the condition of being like Euclidean geometry is certainly something that the U.S. Constitution aspires to. And it's something that the entire history of law in the United States um, aspires to. But it's also like kind of fictional. I mean, it would be we sort of as Americans and I truly don't know how this plays out in a British context. I'd be really interesting to, to hear your thoughts. Um, we have this Euclidean aspiration, which I think is not realized and cannot be realized. I think laws are fundamentally not like that. And, and you know, in, in Euclid, yes, these five axioms really do give you everything. Like all these incredibly complicated things can be rigorously derived step by step from that. Um, in law, the reason we have judges is because these questions are usually, we may want to pretend that they're answerable deductively just from the words in the constitution. Um, it's not really the case. And it's a sort of deep and interesting and hard philosophical question that I don't really understand the answer to whether it's good for us to pretend that it's the case or whether we should stop pretending that it's the case, that that, that law is, like, is, is fundamentally purely deductive enterprise. Well, so the, so the game here is that the American Constitution, which I don't know off by heart, says that we we hold all men to be equal. We forget about the women, but anyway, but that so, so you've got a value, and then you have you know so you list these are the things that we say, and then we're going to work out if we have these values, how do we live our life? Which is which is sort of what geometers do, but in a different. In a, I agree with you about the logic. Well, let's because there's something but else. Can I say one thing about that? Because I think you said it as sort of a, a comic aside, but I think it's very deep and important that um, because a central question is we write these axioms and we say they're self-evidently true, but what are the things that we're talking about? In Euclid, you might say, uh, what is a point? What is a line? What is a circle? Well, in the same way, when interrogating the constitution, you might say like, what is a man? Like, who counts, right? Sort of. So the question of whether a woman counts as a man as part of that definition is is a key question uh, to how to think about what the Constitution actually demands of us. And there's no question that the definition of the words in the document has changed over time. We would now say the plain words of the Constitution, like obviously make it clear that you can't hold another human being as a slave but guess what the people who wrote the document were obviously on board with the fact that that was permissible so. well there's another example you mentioned later on we'll move on anyone who isn't keen on the u.s constitution we'll move, we'll move on from this in a bit but um so there's this concept of invariance in mathematics which basically means if it all works if it, you can do a thing one way you can also do it the other way that's very crude all the mathematicians will hate me but Lincoln applied that to slave owning. So, and he 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 worked out the log- he worked out it was a problem, but he didn't go with it. Tell us a little bit about how you get invariance in questions. Yeah, of owning this is slaves. something that he wrote about right in notes to himself. This is not something he sort of said in public, and it might have been sort of too hot for him to say in public because this was like the eighteen fifties. But he, um, I, you know, he writes, and he writes it in very mathematical terms, like literally using variable names. He writes, if A may enslave B, then Y may not B by the same logic enslave A. So for him, it was very clear that if it was permissible for one person to own another person as property, something which obviously Lincoln was not so on board with. Um, but he was, I think, very much reasoning like a geometer, saying that if you accept that as one of your principles, then you are logically constrained to accept that you are also potential property, like you, the enslaver, <laughs> like, like it is permissible for you to become the property, which is obviously not something that uh, the, the, the slave power, they, they right. were not willing they, to sort of follow the idea that it was yeah. logical in the way that Lincoln was. So, uh, just to remind the audience, uh, the question and answer tab is open. So do be thinking about your questions. Um, Let's move on. So one, well, let's move on to some specific examples. We could talk about geometry itself for quite a long time, but we should probably move on a little bit. So um, topology. Now, that is a word that sounds like a very complicated field, and it is. But you have this example in terms of the number of holes in a straw and in a pair of trousers. And I think this is a really nice example because even within our audience, we will get very different answers to this. So, so pose the question and then explain why this has something to do with geometry. 
Yeah, it's amazing. And the, the question of how many holes are there in a straw? I think I traced it back to its origin. I think I found its origin in like a paper from the early 70s in the Journal of Australasian Philosophy. Um, but unlike most things published in the early 70s in the Journal of Australasian Philosophy, this thing like, became a huge viral hit, like much, much later. And you can find like tons of videos on the internet of people arguing about this. And it really gets to people. This, quite, this simple question of how many holes are there in a straw? And I think the reason is that everyone who hears it is like, well, this question has an obvious answer. And then if they're in a room of multiple people, they're quite startled to find that everyone agrees that there's an obvious answer, but people don't agree on what it is. Now, that's interesting, right? That's always a, a, a sign of something that can generate real discussion. And I think the reason, of course, I'm sort of a little biased here, but I think the reason that people find this sort of so energizing to talk about, and people get really heated if you watch some of these videos, um, is because this question has actual mathematical content. It sort of appears frivolous on the surface, but it is not frivolous and it's not trivial. There's a real question. So you're, that's your, your, you're pointing out to your funding agencies that if, you, if you're asking research questions about trousers, this is very serious science. <laughs> the pants in the US is very serious science. We need to know all of this. But there's a, the, you know, the, the point is it, takes, it, it opens up other doors. It's, it, the nice thing about these geometrical questions, which you make, the point they make in the book is that the type of question often applies in real life as well. Like the, the detailed mathematical complexities might go a long way be, you know beyond what you need to calculate when you're doing your laundry but actually the the, the type of question does apply to to real life and one of the examples that you pick is oh there's so many um uh games and trees and so that and how to play drunk go and so geometry you know even you've said there are logical things and logical concepts but then you go right well if i want to play tic-tac-toe what's that got to do with geometry why does this matter yeah, well, I mean, it has it has everything to do with geometry because the game itself has a geometry. And, you know, this metaphor of the tree is one that's universal. I mean, of course, one that we all know is the family tree. We have these pictures of the sort of the, the big trunk of our ancestors sort of like branching and branching. But any kind of situation in which we make successive decisions has the structure of a tree, right? We're in the situation we're in now, and then we have some decision we make. We're going to take a a path this way or that way. And that branches our life off into the two smaller branches, right? And then we're going to, on each of those branches, we're going to be faced with some other further decision. Um, and that's going to branch each branch further into two narrow branches and so on and so on. And so the shape of our life is in some sense, a tree, some would say a garden of forking paths. It's like a famous metaphor for it. Um, and of course, a game, whether it's tic-tac-toe or checkers or guess or, or chess or go, it's a metaphor for life, right? That's why it's interesting. It's not interesting because we care about like red and black circles on a checkerboard. I'm supposed to say drafts, right? Is that what I say? Uh, yeah, we would call it drafts in the UK. Yeah. Um, so we're interested in that because it sort of feels like life feels. You sort of have this succession of decisions to make. Each one has stakes for the eventual outcome and it can be hard to figure out. It requires some real thought to sort of like think several steps down the line. Um, but the tree of a game is, is much like a tree of life. But the advantage is that because games are much more formal than real life, uh, you can really analyze the game mathematically. Uh, and that turns into a sort of mathematical exercise on a formal mathematical object, which is called a tree. You know, in math, we like to sort of, we don't like to give our objects, like, we're not like the biologists who give all their things, these like very complicated, like long names that are new words. We like to call a thing like a tree. If it looks like a tree. You haven't, met the ocean trees, biologists, like a you haven't met the ocean biologists who call all their fish after things on land, like goatfish and parrotfish and cowfish. But anyway. Oh, that is that true. Is, okay, fair enough, fair there enough. There are exceptions. <laughs> but okay, so the, the point is that you, this, you can analyze this mathematically. And, but the, so let's take a step on from that to difficulty. And, you know, because um, you, make the, you, you say something very honest, which I think I agree with you, it's not said very often, which is that, that maths can be difficult for humans, but the difficulty means different things to humans and machines. Um, so just take us through that a little bit, because that's the sort of thing where this is, you know, this is surely we should use maths for the things that humans find difficult or machines to do the things that humans find difficult. Yeah, well, I think this is one of the most fascinating things. And like a lot of mathematicians have gotten very interested in AI over the last 10 years and sort of the sort of geometric underpinnings of how these systems work. I try to demystify that a bit in the book. Um, 
But one of the things that is so interesting is I think that we come into it with a naive idea that there is easy problems and hard problems. And there's like, you know, more intelligent beings and less intelligent beings. Um, and that's what I would call like a one dimensional view, a view that there's just sort of like a line from easy to difficult. And once machines surpass us on that line, then they're better than us. So again, I'm using a geometrical metaphor to talk about geometric things. There's not one dimension of difficulty. There's many. And I think one of the super interesting things that's going on in AI is we're sort of just at the very beginning of understanding um, what kind of problems these machines are good at and what they're bad at. Um, the fact that they're better at us than chess does not mean they're better at us than anything. Chess and Go and all these things seem to be problems which are in some ways very well adapted. At the same time, a robot can't fold a shirt. You probably think folding a shirt is easier I think than it's boring. playing master level go. But that's, <laughs> what, that's, that's like I think the, the one dimensional model, right? There's many <laughs> right. dimensions of difficulty. And I think it's super, I, I have to admit, I'm kind of a techno optimist. Like I sort of love these new developments. I think they're super interesting. I don't think that machines will sort of supplant humans or make us their slaves. I sort of like prefer to think that they're going to be partners because even as now, right? There's like lots of stuff machines are, way machines are way better at going 60 miles down a highway than people are unaided um so we use them to help us do that and we do other right. things by ourselves uh yes and there's a, the whole the difference between uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is very interesting but and i am very much i think it's machine learning and not artificial intelligence we'd all benefit from thinking of it like that but anyway several points so just before we go to audience questions and i can see there's a few come in and audience be asking your questions i have one one question for you one other question for you for now which is that um so i i grew up in the north of england and i had a very sensible northern nana and um uh yeah you, you know what nana i don't is know like what grandma. that means does that mean grandmother grandma, like grandmother mean? yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, I told her once she found me studying quantum mechanics, you know, I'm a physicist. And she said, oh, what can you do when you know that? Which was a very good question. <laughs> so I, this is my question to you. Once someone has read your book, what can you do when you know that? So that is a great question. And what I would say um, I mean, there's two parts to any book, right? I mean, on some level, um, I write about what I'm excited about and I want other people to feel that excitement. So one aspect is simply that like exciting things are exciting and in the same way watching an exciting movie is exciting. Like, um, and presumably the people doing the stunts and like running away from the explosions were excited while it was happening. I'm excited while I'm learning stuff and I'm excited while I'm writing about the stuff I'm learning about and I want to bring that to other people too. So that's the emotional side of it. Um, the practical side, I think would bring it back to near where we started with Abraham Lincoln and this idea of proving things and this idea of not saying what you can can't back up. I think that's a very, very powerful idea. And maybe one important point is I think something people say a lot is like, why am I going to school and learning how to prove facts? In real life, there is no proofs, right? In real life, I'm not going to like prove some fact about the angles of a triangle. I'm not going to need to know that. Nobody's ever going to approach me and sort of demand that I tell them that proof in like the next 30 seconds or I'm in trouble. No. Um, but what the world is full of is non-proofs. The world is full of people saying in a bullying tone of voice, logically, you must accept that blank, something that is in their interest for you to believe. And once you know what a real proof is, really know it, really know what it looks like in Euclid or what it looks like in Euclid's many successors, I think you're much more immune to that kind of bullying. You're much more able to sort of see what you say logically must follow does not logically follow. You may be right and you may be wrong, but whatever you're saying, you didn't prove it. And I think that's a very valuable thing to be able to do on your own. I think, and to be able to analyze what you're doing. So it's the same, you know, just for science in general, there's a lot of discussions about science in general that you have to look at deeply to, to answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. And you have to be able to do it to yourself too, right? Not yeah. just sort of your enemy, yeah, but yeah. you have to like approach yourself in the same and way. And it's, it's an integrity, yourself. there's an integrity in taking that responsibility, which I exactly. think that's, that's the thing that's built into both maths and sciences that I have to be responsible for having the integrity here to do all the things and, you know, no and scientists, by gone. the way, it's, you know, we, we are accorded so much respect and prestige, mathematicians, physicists, all sciences. It's a responsibility. I mean, I think we have an incredible amount, an incredible requirement to act with integrity because people rely on us. I mean, people, we are granted a lot of authority by society. So we better be really careful about how we use it. 
But I think it, there's also the, that, that, that aspect where, um, as you said with Lincoln, most scientists can't imagine fibbing, right? They can't imagine not, not going, not really checking what they're doing. Okay, right, some questions here. So uh, we have a question from Georgie, which is that if people tell you they struggle with geometry, but not with maths in general, what do you say? Well, I say, and it's actually something I started on the very first page of the book, I say, and I was told that this doesn't land for British people, so we can argue about this. I say geometry is the cilantro of math. I think in England it's called coriander. Coriander, <laughs> right? It's something that people, uh, like a lot of people love it. Way, so, so a lot of people, Georgie, would say the exact opposite of you. They would say, none of it made sense for me except for geometry. But then there's other people, and I'm going to be honest with you, I was one of them when I was a kid who found that to be the geometry, the most puzzling and off-putting in certain ways, part of the subject. Um, but what everybody agrees on is it's kind of different. And I think that's one of the things that drew me to it as a subject for the book. I was like, it clearly sticks out in the math curriculum. It's different from everything else. What is it about it that causes people to have this fascination, sometimes dread, like sometimes joy, but in any event, it, 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 it strikes people as different. So what I would say to your question is simply, your experience is extremely common. I think I would even say most people feel that that somehow doesn't quite fit with the rest of the math curriculum and it feels very different. Uh, we have an, a very, uh, yes, well, an interesting question from Harry. Uh, maybe this could happen, maybe it couldn't. And he's very enthusiastic about your enthusiasm, but he also says, um, are there geometric advisors for governments? And what improvements would we see if, uh, if there were? Um, I mean, I think certainly in the United States, I think that there's a pretty good interplay between governmental actors and scientific actors. And I think like whether people are officially, whether your job, whether, whether, whether what it says on your business card is I'm a geometer or not, um, for instance, all the people, and one thing I read a lot about in the book, and another reason it was longer than I planned is because I suddenly got super interested in pandemic spread, which I didn't know I was interested in until early last year. And so I wrote a lot about that, right? All the people who are talking about flattening the curve, what more geometric metaphor could there be? So those folks who are building these models and thinking about spread through a network, that's a geometric process, right? And so and so I think that, um, that actually is happening. I mean, again, at the risk of stepping into waters, I don't really know anything about, isn't like this fellow Dominic Cummings, like a huge math lover or something. I have some sense that he's like super, super into math and like he aspired to be like the geometric advisor. Right. But I, I know think, nothing about really who he is. So like, um, no, I think, I think the, the charitable view might be that he thought he was, but his <laughs> okay. grasp of the detail wasn't necessarily very good, but he wanted to be I see. that person. Um, so yes, we probably shouldn't get into it. But I think, but the point, point, the point is that it actually follows on from something you said, which is that we give authority to this understanding, but it only works if the responsibility comes with it, and that you can't like what isn't on is to play a half game to play to to wear the cloak, but not to walk the walk. That's the that's the danger. Okay, we've got um, a question here from Sheila, which is, do we get worse at understanding shapes as we get older? And if we do, or even if we don't, I suppose, is there something we can do to improve that? Oh, that's a great question. And it's a little bit, you know, the sort of cognitive science of math understanding is a little bit outside what I know well. I think what I can say is that and I don't think this is a particular a feature particular to geometric reasoning. I think it's sort of true for all kinds of things is that certainly we're better at acquiring new skills when we're younger. I'm not so sure I think that the skills we have degrade as we get older when it comes to geometric thinking, but I do think um, it, beco it becomes harder to, to learn something new about geometry. Um, Can we practice? Does it brain. get better if you practice? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, in some sense, part of geometric intuition, we are always practicing. And I think that's one reason that people respond. Um, I, I think on some level, it's much more embodied within us than something like algebraic reasoning. And I think algebra is like a purely formal enterprise. There's no part of us that's built to do it. Reasoning geometrically, you know, if something is flying towards your head, like, is it flying right at your head? Or is it sort of aimed like 
a foot to the left of your head? That's sort of an, a fundamentally geometric question that we're probably built to be able to compute like pretty well. So I think I think probably geometry is much more a sort of factory installed standard in our body than some other parts of uh, than, uh, some other parts of mathematical reasoning. Very useful for survival. So I'm just going to ask our technical team to put the diagram back up. Uh, we have still got some more questions. People can ask questions about what what's on the diagram and what isn't. But I just want yeah, to. Yeah, we covered a lot of those things. We've actually. covered a lot quite a lot of, of things. It's always so, surprising how many of the little boxes we hit. Um, so we've got a question here that you might know more about than me and it's from Sharon and the question is what did Rabbi Eliza do and was there another rabbi who thought the exact opposite I'm not sure if this is a well-known rabbi yeah I mean um I, I'm not gonna try to claim that I have a mental ranking of like who's a well-known rabbi but this, I, I he comes Rabbi Eliezer comes in at the very end of the book in this famous uh Talmudic story um of the oven of Achnai uh, and all Talmudic stories are kind of like long and shaggy dog like and go on and on. So I'll like sort of tell the short version. It's this like whole group of rabbis who are disputing, which is what rabbis do when there's they get together in a group, uh, some very fine point of the law. And they're arguing and arguing. And finally, you know, they take a vote and Rabbi Eliezer is in the minority. In fact, it's just him against everybody else. And their rule is that, you know, majority wins. This is how these religious disputes were. Um, and then Rabbi Eliezer is like, okay, well, look, like, let's let God settle it. And God comes down and is like, okay, Rabbi, Al Rabbi Eliezer is right. And the other rabbis say like, hey, look, we have a system. We took a vote, like <laughs> majority rules. But out. <laughs> um, and in this moment, and Talmudic stories are so weird and awesome. So in this moment, what's the response? Um, God laughs. He like bursts out laughing and is like, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me and leaves. So, so you know, rather, and I think I put this story at the end uh, in conjunction with this wonderful Rita Dove poem called Geometry, sort of to bring back to poetry, um, because I really think it speaks to what people want from geometry, that it gives the authority to you. It says there's a system and you can work out the knowledge yourself and no authority, not even God himself, can shake you from it. If you worked it out, like it's true, like you have it. And so the, you know, the sort of famous saying about this is in the Talmud is like, the Torah is not in heaven. The Torah is down here. The rule book is down here. You sort of reason from it. And what the reasoning you do with what you have here on earth, like that's solid and incontrovertible. And I think that's sort of something that people just throughout the centuries have found like incredibly moving and incredibly exciting about geometric thinking. It's very democratic in that sense that everyone can get there by themselves. Yeah, I mean, and that's how Lincoln saw it too. I mean, I do think that it's, you know, geometry and democracy are the kind of two like ancient Greek innovations that like, I mean, they sort of, they're two great tastes that go great together. We've got another question here from Graham and we still have some extra time for questions. There's a lot here, but if you've got any last questions, now is the time to put them in. Um, a question from Graham, which is what was the research process like for this book? And this is a, this is a particularly good question because there's a, I mean, there's a lot of very, random stuff in here i mean it's brilliant but the, it's very eclectic <laughs> so how did you how did you go about finding all of that I, yeah i honestly i would probably be better off if i had a more organized research process i cannot say that i do i had some things i knew i wanted to write about um i wrote a proposal you know i got i arranged with the press they said great let's do it and i started writing but then you know as you write you sort of spend your day like reading like documents in the 19th century, like learning about these people you're going to write about. Because, you know, I always say, you know, math is made of people. So to write about this stuff and not write a textbook, you're writing about the people who did the math. You're writing about what they were thinking and what they were trying to do. And then they have like life stories and their stories take you all kinds of crazy places. So honestly, my process, maybe it should be more organized, but it works is I'm reading about stuff and I'm learning stuff. And then if I'm excited I'm like, well, hell, I'm going to write about that. It might not be what I plan, but if I'm like spending my whole day, I can't stop like going down this like weird rabbit hole of something I didn't plan to write about. If I'm feeling that, then hopefully I can make you feel that on the page. And I just let that be my guide. And so it, it does mean that the book ends up being like a little nonlinear because if I, if, if the rabbit starts running, I like chase it. Um, That's great. I, I mean, I don't think anyone should have to apologize for that. And it is also like, life's messiness is part of its joy so like the fact that all of these things are true in the same world that, yeah that's and the great. publisher is always my you know penguin has always been very kind about the fact that i turn in a book and then i'm like yeah there was some stuff i said i was gonna write about that i didn't write about and then some other like you know tons and tons of pages about stuff i didn't tell you i was gonna write about but you know they they always seem to be like if it if it you know if it if it's 
has electricity on the page, like we'll print it, which I love about them. So. Okay, question from Fred. Uh, if you got a grant, a research grant tomorrow for a million dollars, what would you study with it? Oh, I mean, the thing about what I do in my research life as a pure mathematician is, and I, I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't say this too loud in case any of my funders are actually listening to this, but it doesn't require a lot of resources. You know, I got to have my, I got to have my laptop so I can look stuff up and I've got to have like, um, you know, some nice quadrille paper to write on and like a bunch of pens that work. And I don't need that much more than that. So honestly, is this terrible to say? Like, I, I hope I'd like, I well, I'm an experimentalist think... that spends my entire time scrabbling for money to do stuff. So I won't be yeah, bitter. It's fine. Exactly. I would give it, to, <laughs> I would give it to my local experimentalist, right. Who like, who needs it to sort of build some component to some device. No, I mean, I, I, I sort of hate to admit it, but that's true. I mean, I think, um, I, I, let me try to seriously answer the question. I think what that money would be for would not be sort of to prove the next theorem in number theory, which doesn't need that much money. I think there's stuff I'm interested in, like how can we do more outward facing science? How can there be more scientists who are who like me and like you are sort of talking directly to the public? I can tell you, and I'm sure you would agree with this. There's a huge hunger among scientists to do that, but it's a skill that has to be built. I mean, it takes like a lot of training and practice to actually do it. Um, and I think it would be cool to really try to establish a pipeline in some sort of more formal way for PhD students in science, let's say, uh, to be like, how do you write a thousand word magazine article or newspaper article about something that you feel like people don't know that they would be better off knowing? Um, I think with a million dollars, you could actually sort of think of good ways to sort of start, uh, to start programs like that. And of course, that involves like paying people to do that training. And that's where the money would go. People are expensive, just like physics equipment. Um, okay, a couple more questions here. Uh, you say that mathematicians often want to be poets. So have you got any plans to release a poetry anthology? No, but I was. So, you know, just to sort of do a little biography. So I was a regular writer before. I mean, I, I was going to go be a novelist. Like I sort of went and did a degree in creative writing before I got my PhD in math. Um, I wrote a novel. It was published. Very few people have purchased it or read it. I mean, I think those who did liked it. OK, um, so I do sort of come from that world, not poetry, like prose fiction, but um let me put it this way. I feel like this is a better way. I mean, look, as a, I mean, this book is about math, but I do like read the, I, I do read the sentences aloud. Like I do like think a lot about the rhythm of the sentences and like the words sounding good together. So I think that's about, that's enough of an outlet for like whatever residual poetical interests I have. Okay, we are almost out of time, but we have one final question from Sarah, which is a good one to finish on, and I'm going to add an extension to it. And Sarah's question is, how does geometry factor into your life and the decisions you make? And my extension is, how can geometry factor into all of our lives? I think, you know, we talked about using this kind of like, these habits of rigorous thinking as ways to prevent ourselves from being bamboozled by people who are trying to bully us. But I think probably even more important than that on a daily basis is just using them to question yourself. You know, so I should say, you know, my, my wife is a therapist. My wife is trained in clinical psychology. She's a researcher now. She doesn't see patients, but she has a PhD in clinical psych. And I actually think just that experience, there is a lot that's in common between the discipline of psychotherapy and the discipline of geometry. And that both ask you to, how to put this, to not think unthinkingly, but rather to sort of think more reflectively and be like every thought that bubbles to your mind, every sort of thing that you feel like asserting, say to yourself, like, where'd that come from? And like, what's, what's backing it up? Like what's behind it? Now, of course, when you start talking about psychology, uh, it's not going to be like, what's behind it is this chain of deductive reasons like starting from this axiom but it's also not totally not like that and I think that habit is actually like a pretty interesting one for um for kind of clarifying to yourself what it is that you're thinking about and why so there you go that's the message to our audience think think about what you're thinking 
there you go uh, we are out of time thank you so much jordan it's been a real pleasure to talk to you thank a reminder you. to our audience that the book which is called shape and has a, a, a dorito on the front other chips are available and um, is available for purchase on the hay festival website uh, and in your local bookstore and next month the hay book of the month will be uh, the sleeping beauties by suzanne o'sullivan uh, so that's the book of the month for july and there'll be another live question and answer session on thursday the 22nd of july so the event is free and you can register now and that's it for today. So thank you very much, everyone who's been listening in on this session. Thank you for your questions. Uh, good luck with thinking about your thinking and uh, goodbye. Thanks, everybody.